Hey everyone, today's video is on the surgical management of pancreatic cancer. And specifically in this video, we're going to be talking about pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Um, the other cancers are much less common. Uh, maybe we'll cover them in the functional peanuts and stuff like that in another video. But right now we're talking about pancreatic cancer in the terms of pancreatic ductal uh, adenocarcinoma. And this is a very um, difficult cancer to deal with. And this is primarily related to its anatomic location and features. And so when we think about the pancreas, it's kind of tucked away back here uh, in the, the very inaccessible retroperitoneum. And it's surrounded by a lot of high price, very important real estate. So we got our pancreas back here, right behind us, the aorta, right? We've got major vascular structures, the aorta, the IVC. We got the celiac axis right here. We got the SMA, the SMB coming out right here. We've got the duodenum, the liver, the bile ducts. Um, and what this means is, one, there's no real good surveillance, right? You can't just do a scope like a colonoscopy to look at the pancreas. Um, you can't just easily get some tissue from the pancreas anytime you might want to. Um, and there's not a lot of symptoms that happen until the pancreatic cancer has had time to grow and spread into one of these surrounding structures that has caused some symptoms. And so usually by the time that thing has, has grown, it's also had a lot of time to seed micrometastases elsewhere um, that couldn't be treated by a primary surgery. So we've got a pretty remote, um, relatively asymptomatic organ. We've got a bunch of complex anatomy close by that one can make something unresectable if it invades into some of that very important anatomy. Um, or even if it doesn't, makes the surgery very difficult. You need to be a very good surgical candidate to undergo one of these major operations um, and makes complications much more likely. You know, the pancreas, a big issue with the pancreas and pancreatitis is the autodigestion, the pancreatic enzymes. Once they get released, they really damage the surrounding tissue, prevent healing. Well, imagine you know, doing a, an anastomosis to the pancreas, that anastomosis is very likely to leak or fail in certain ways. And so we have this combination of a late presenting cancer and a very complex reconstruction. Uh, and because of that, uh, only 15 to 20% of patients with pancreatic cancer um, that are diagnosed are actually candidates for surgical resection. And um, that fact and these facts about its tough location, um, it's difficult anatomy, are the reasons for some of the decisions that we make around the treatment of pancreatic cancer that we'll get into later in this video uh, and why it's different from many of the other cancers treated by surgeons like colon cancer, uh, rectal cancer, et cetera, some breast cancer, the other ones we've talked about. So going back to the fact that we don't have a common, easy screening test, like for example, a mammogram or a colonoscopy, uh, how do we even begin to diagnose these patients with pancreatic cancer? And this is usually based on some patient symptoms, some patient complaints. And so the most common complaint is probably abdominal pain. Um, of course, the classic board answer is painless jaundice, right? Where the pancreatic mass is obstructing the bile duct and you get the symptom of jaundice before it um, demonstrates any pain. Um, but if we're being realistic, usually you get pain with your jaundice. Uh, of course, weight loss is common with any cancer. Um, and also, this can just be an incidental finding when you get a CT scan uh, for some other reason. But again, usually they're having pain. It's kind of a chronic, non-epigastric pain. They get scanned because of that pain, and then you find a mass in the pancreas. And so, okay, at this time, you've got a patient with symptoms that are concerning. You've got a CT scan that shows a mass. And then the question is, now what do you do? The obvious question, answer for most other cancers would be just obtain a biopsy, get some tissue, um, do some staging and go from there. But again, the pancreas is actually in such a difficult location uh, that the pathway can be a little bit different sometimes. We'll get into exactly how. But regardless of that, um, we're still going to do a complete workup once we have uh, enough concerns based on our patient symptoms and our imaging findings. And so just like any other cancer, we want to think about our labs, our imaging, and then our other tests. For pancreas cancer, the lab is a CA199. This is actually not a great test as far as cancer biomarkers go. Uh, a couple of issues with it often, like we talked about with jaundice, right? Pancreatic cancer presents with hyperbilirubinemia. And when your bilirubin is elevated, um, that will falsely elevate your CA199. So an elevated CA199 does not necessarily mean pancreatic cancer. It could be uh, caused by a benign obstruction or even biliary infection, things like that. So if you do have jaundice, um, that CA199 is really not interpretable until the biliary system has been drained. Uh, when we're talking about imaging, you would already have your CT admin usually. You would complete that with a full chest admin pelvis uh, with contrast to look at the pancreas. You want that CT of the abdomen to be a pancreatic protocol CT, which means some really thin cuts at the level of the pancreas. And then, um, especially if your CT is not that great, you might want some other studies. Uh, and this is optional, but if you want better visualization, you can do an endoscopic ultrasound 
uh, looking at the pancreas, uh, either the head um, or even the body and tail of the pancreas looking through the stomach. Uh, and you can use the EUS to also get a corneal needle biopsy if that's something you're looking for. So to go a little bit deeper into the biopsy, um, this is one of the few cancers where you can proceed with surgery without a biopsy um, if you are not planning on doing neoadjuvant therapy. If you are planning on doing neoadjuvant therapy, those patients do need an EUS and do need a corneal biopsy. And that's becoming more and more common, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later as well. All right, so once we've done our full staging, now it's time to um, get our formal staging of this cancer. And remember that typically this was done with the TNM staging or tumor nodes metastasis. And while this does exist for pancreatic cancer, um, I do not want you to memorize it at all. Uh, I've not find it, found it useful for surgery. Uh, it's something you can look up if you need it. Um, but there's actually a unique, almost surgical staging that's used for pancreatic cancer. And that's what you should really be spending your time on uh, if you're involved in the surgical aspect of this care. And that is, for lack of a better term, I'll call it the resectability criteria or resectability staging. And that consists of three categories. There's resectable disease, which just is what it sounds like. That's disease that can be resected with a surgery. There's borderline resectable disease that's kind of on the edge. Um, it's a little bit close. Maybe you could become resectable with something like neoadjuvant therapy. And then unresectable is disease that is definitely not um, able to be treated surgically. Uh, for example, something like distant metastases. So to get into these specific stages, this is complex. This is a pretty complex slide. Uh, you might want to pause the video after this and just review this slide a little bit and really kind of drill this into your head. But resectability, uh, these criteria are primarily based on the relation of the tumor to the local vascular anatomy. Remember, we talked about how much important vasculature lives around the pancreas. And so when we're talking about arterial involvement here, we're referring to the SMA, the common hepatic artery, also sometimes called the CHA, uh, and the celiac axis. When we're talking about venous structures, we're talking about the SMV and the portal vein. So now talking about our criteria. So remember, resectable, these are patients who can get surgery up front. They're good. They're reasonable candidates for surgery. Uh, and that means no arterial abutment from the tumor, abutment just meaning kind of the tumor touching the artery, uh, and less than 180 degree abutment of the vein, the venous, venous structures uh, with the tumor itself. Borderline resectable is just kind of the next step up from that. So you can have less than 180 degree arterial involvement this time, um, and you can have greater than 180 degrees, so kind of from 180 to 360 degree involvement of the vein, as long as that vein can be reconstructed um, if you had to take it out on block with a tumor specimen. Um, also, involvement of the IVC automatically makes you borderline resectable. And unresectable disease is greater than 180 degree involvement of any of the above arterial structures or any involvement of the aorta or venous involvement that is unable to be reconstructed. So there's so much venous involvement that you couldn't um, reconstruct that vein during the operation. And these criteria for unresectable disease would be called locally advanced. And remember, that's not the only type of unresectable disease. So this is locally advanced disease. Um, also disease with distant meths would also be unresectable. And remember, this is complex. I think, you know, take some time to memorize it as best you can, but know that in real life, this is a very important time for tumor board. You know, this is, these are hard decisions to make just based on your own review of imaging. So you want to have the radiologist there, the radiation oncologist, med -onc, surgeons, et cetera, everybody talking about uh, the results of these scans and deciding which patients are resectable, borderline resectable or unresectable. All right, so now we're going to focus on what is our treatment based on these stages now. And so as you might have guessed, the first stage we'll talk about is resectable, and you have two options for treatment here. You can either just go to surgery first. Remember, this is the category of patients that qualify for surgery, at least based on their disease characteristics, uh, but that's actually becoming a little bit more rare. Um, and your other option is to give neoadjuvant surgery first um, and then go to surgery. And so why is this becoming more rare? Well, remember, like we've talked about, the surgery is on an organ that you really don't like to operate on, right? It's the pancreas. Uh, it's in a very uh, fraught location. Uh, the surgeries are very difficult and very morbid. We'll discuss this a little bit more later as well. Um, and so the neoadjuvant therapy actually gives the tumor a 
trial of tumor biology, we like to say. And so if the tumor responds well to neoadjuvant therapy, you think, oh, good, you know, maybe this tumor is actually contained. If we take it out with surgery, maybe we'll be able to treat any residual disease with neoadjuvant and the patient can actually have a good outcome. However, if the tumor biology is not favorable uh, and they go on neoadjuvant and progress on neoadjuvant disease, um, that patient probably wouldn't have benefited from surgery either. And now you've spared them a morbid operation um, and given them a chance to kind of have the best quality of life uh, for the time that they have rather than having a potentially um, not helpful operation and dealing with the complications of that. Now, again, with your second option, if they did not have a biopsy already and you decided that you wanted them to undergo neoadjuvant therapy, uh, you would need to do that EUS and get your biopsy. Um, when we're talking about neoadjuvant therapy, your options are basically fulfirinox or dimcitabine, paclitaxel. Remember that fulfirinox stands for folinic acid, 5-FU, arenatecan, and oxaliplatin. Uh, we're not going to go too into any of those regimens. That's just kind of what I would know as a surgery resident or a surgical trainee. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is when we're making our decision between these two points, there are some high risk features that might push you towards neoadjuvant therapy as well. Um, these are things like concerning imaging findings, a very high CA199, again, remember with an elevated bilirubin, um, a very large primary tumor, large lymphadenopathy on scans or excessive weight loss and pain. So again, I think as medicine, um, continues to progress, um, chemotherapy gets better. We are just moving more and more towards almost all of our patients getting some sort of neoadjuvant therapy before surgery, even if they are resectable. All right. And so there's not really too much to add here when we're talking about borderline resectable disease, um, except that none of these patients are candidates for surgery up front. So we're really talking about getting a biopsy if we didn't have one already, undergoing neoadjuvant therapy with the same regimens that we talked about on the last slide. And then you really should do this regardless of their initial stage. But after you give somebody new adjuvant therapy, you'd want to restage them with imaging, see how they responded. Did they improve? Uh, did they worsen on therapy? Uh, how did this change? Are they, instead of borderline now, are they resectable? Did the tumor recede away from those vascular structures, et cetera? And of course, the final stage is unresectable. Um, these patients are not surgical candidates, so they would go to the medical oncologist for systemic therapy, some combination of chemotherapy and or radiation. All right, and so now we're talking about surgery again. Uh, we've decided that our patients are either a candidate for surgery or they've undergone their new adjuvant therapy, responded well, we are going to proceed with surgery. And the important thing to remember is that step one, especially for pancreatic cancer, is to rule out any distant disease. So if you get into the abdomen, you see any peritoneal mets, liver mets, distant lymph node mets, um, you would want to sample those with a biopsy and then abort your operation. Remember, we do not want the complications of a Whipple uh, without any benefit to the patient if they already have distant disease. Now, if you've ruled out distant disease, you can actually proceed to step two, which is going to be a resection. And when we do resections, um, if it's a tumor in the head of the pancreas, we're talking about a Whipple procedure. If it's more distal in the tail, we're talking a distal pancreatectomy with a splenectomy. Uh, there's no role for splenic preservation when we're talking about a cancer as severe as pancreatic cancer. And then if the tumor locally invades uh, some other resectable organs, for example, stomach or colon, things like that, those organs would be resected on block um, with the pancreas specimen. And just a few quick pictures kind of going over these options. We're not going to go over these in detail. These are very complex procedures and we could do whole videos on each of them. Um, but just to briefly review, so again, if the tumor, this is the pancreas back here, if the tumor is more in the head, we do a Whipple procedure, which involves resecting the pancreas head, <coughs> excuse me, um, potentially the neck, resecting part of the stomach, the duodenum, a little bit of the jejunum, as well as the common bile duct and the gallbladder. And so afterwards, you're going to have to restock, reset, reconstruct that remnant pancreas onto the intestines. Um, you're going to have to do so that's your PJ right there. You're going to have to do your colodoco jejunostomy, your CJ, uh, where you connect the bile duct uh, to the intestine there. And then you're going to have to do your GJ as well, your gastro jejunostomy to hook up your stomach. So again, complex resection, complex reconstruction. Um, your options, if it's a more distal tumor in the tail of the pancreas, are a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy. You remove those on block. Uh, the Whipple can be, this shows a non-pylorus preserving some 
modifications have been made to do things like preserve the pylorus. Uh, we're not going to get into that right now. There's not really been any convincing data showing that one method is superior to the others. All right, a lot of information, uh, but we're getting through it. Just a little bit more to go. Uh, a few post-operative considerations. So one is who gets adjuvant therapy? This is actually pretty easy, as you might have guessed, considering we're moving towards everyone getting new adjuvant therapy. Um, almost everybody that has a resection for pancreatic cancer will undergo adjuvant therapy just to give them the absolute best chance of avoiding recurrence. Um, this is going to be some combination of chemotherapy plus or minus radiation. Again, that's more of a med topic. We're not going to go too deep into that. Uh, but something that we really should think about, and this is related to who we think are good candidates for and who would benefit from a pancreatic procedure, are the complications of these Whipples and distal pancs. And so these complications are common. We're talking like 40 to 50% of patients that undergo these procedures have a complication. And it's not all just straightforward, you know, short complications. Oh, they bled, they need a unit of blood or things like that. We're talking about complications that can oftentimes have pretty significant quality of life impacts uh, for a long time. And so some of those complications that are specific to pancreatic surgery are things like the pancre or the post-operative pancreatic fistula or delayed gastric emptying. And so the pancreatic fistula, uh, that's basically where there's a leak uh, where you're from your pancreas that is persistent. Remember that pancreatic juice digests all the tissue around it. So if it's leaking out um, where things are trying to heal, it's very likely to keep leaking and keep preventing that spot from healing. Uh, that can lead to a very um, either post-operative fluid collections or just really prolonged drain placements or maybe replacements um, numerous procedures and patients dealing with drains and being uncomfortable for a long time. And then delayed gastric emptying is just uh, the stomach failing to empty well after the local procedure, uh, which leads to real limitations on people being able to eat. Uh, they have lots of issues with nausea. And again, these things can last for weeks to months and really impact people's quality of life. So um, remember a Whipple or a, a really any pancreatectomy is not a benign procedure. Uh, and you really want one, a candidate that's strong enough to handle that procedure uh, but you also want to know that you're going to give that patient a good chance um, to have a good quality, a good um, life extension benefit from your surgery uh, because they will have a reasonable chance of dealing with some complications. And again, those are complex topics. There's whole classification systems around postoperative pancreatic fistula and DGE that we may get into in a later video. All right. So finally at the end, so to, to briefly review, Remember, pancreatic cancer is a very difficult cancer uh, to treat and manage medically. Um, this is related to its uh, retroperitoneal anatomy that leads to a often delayed diagnosis, as well as very complex morbid reconstructions. Um, when we're talking about our workup, we're talking about labs like CA199, um, a full CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, plus or minus an EUS and biopsy. And remember that you definitely need the biopsy if you're looking at systemic therapy or neoadjuvant therapy, but that resectable patients may not need a biopsy uh, and could potentially go straight to surgery. For straight staging, focus on that slide that we talked about, the differences between resectable, borderline resectable, and unresectable, and don't focus so much on your TNM staging. That's a very unique feature of this cancer. Uh, when we're talking about treatment, um, remember that a lot of our patients get neoadjuvant therapy, but there are certain resectable patients that are good candidates for upfront surgery. Um, remember that our neoadjuvant options are typically fulfirinox uh, or gem taxol regimens. Uh, our surgical options are Whipples or distal panc spleens. And then finally, remember that we have our pancreas or pancreatectomy specific complications, the DGE and postoperative pancreatic fistula. All right, that's it. These videos are for educational purposes only. I'm not using them to diagnose or treat any diseases. This is not clinical advice, and we will see you next time.